my phone. Um, so we are going to do a couple of uh, yeah. lines of business tonight. The first one is the presentation to um, so the irrigation consultant. And you guys here? How are you doing? So uh, if I could uh, interject real quick, as you mentioned, these are our topics that you see on the agenda tonight. Um, we wanted to start in case there was anything that was uh, wanted to be updated from a permitting standpoint, Jack, if you wanted to say anything, we want to give you the floor or not. I'll give you a very, very quick. Um, I am going to leave here uh, and meet Joe and Steve Garvin from Sammy Otis at the Conservation Commission. Uh, Nick told us that they had four public hearings, so we don't have to be there before seven. I told Steve 645. Um, we won't mention why. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I don't think we're going to finish tonight because the test pits uh, were done yesterday. And as of noon, Steve was still compiling the information. So I think it is highly likely that we will finish with the Conservation Commission two weeks from tonight. Uh, the planning board. Uh, is not meeting on April 1st. They're meeting on April 2nd because they have a joint public hearing with the City Council. They asked us to finish with them on the 22nd, I think is the date, and hopefully we'll finish with the Zoning Board on April 11th, so all of that permitting hopefully will be in place uh, before the month is over. We'll wait for the appeal periods, um, but that won't interfere with um, the uh, the May bidding, which is really the the critical area for those uh, for those permits. So I think we're I think we're in pretty good shape right now. <coughs> right, thanks. So our irrigation consultant is here, Jeff Bowman, um, and he's here to talk to you about a little about irrigation options for the city with the fields. Turn over to him. Just a minute. So good good afternoon. I do see quite a few familiar faces. There are a few new ones. So I've been working with Castle Booz in this project for probably around six months now. Uh, we're charged with designing the irrigation system for the new athletic fields as well as finding a, a suitable water supply for it. So um, here's a quick overview of um, this is the red. This is which one's the red? One? The laser. The laser. Okay. okay. So here's the three. It we're basically TV. <laughs> proposing to irrigate three fields, um, which are located to the west, uh, to the east rather, and to the south of the uh, new high school footprint. In total, um, we have approximately 340,000 square feet of athletic field um, natural grass that we're trying to irrigate during peak demand times, which would be the months of June, July, and August when we don't have any uh, up, uh, rainfall that's effective. We're looking at a peak demand of around 55,000 gallons per day to meet the peak. Um, if you translate that to a uh, flow rate to satisfy those daily demands, that's approximately 150 gallons per minute. That is watering the fields around six to seven hours per night. We don't want to irrigate athletic fields more than eight hours a night because then you start to impact their ability to be played on and also you're going to promote fungus. You're having plants that are uh, wet. If you start to water too early at night, Plants are going to stay wet throughout the whole course of the night, and it's going to add to fungus pressure. So we try to condense our watering window, again, to around six to seven hours per night. Okay. So just graphically, this just shows the coverage of the proposed irrigation system. So what are the options to supply water to these fields? We broke them down. Basically, essentially, we're looking at, A, a public water supply. Uh, the benefits of a public water supply is it's very, it's reliable, it's under pressure, and it's high quality water. But, you know, the downside to that is it's the, there's poor optics to it, right? We're using water that's been, that's been manufactured for human consumption and using it for turf grass irrigation. So that is opposed to the second option, which would be using groundwater sources. It's also expensive. It's, well, Indeed, yes, it's expensive and as well. One of the things we're trying to do is to remove pressure from the school budget, correct? Yeah, I haven't looked at the exact water rates of that, but you're right. Um, if we're paying for that water from the from the water purveyor, then you've got that whole other um, you know cost implication for ongoing um, purchase of, of of this water. So the second option would be looking at groundwater, and what we did 
back in the fall was we did a pump test of an existing shallow uh, groundwater well at the Brennan Field site. Uh, the pump test did yield a fairly high uh, rate of water flow, but the problem with that water is it's enriched with iron and manganese. So if that water were to hit anything that is hard like a, a walkway, a building, a soccer goal post, a light post, anything that it hits, it's going to sting. All right, and that's something that it's just it's going to be ongoing. It's not going to relieve itself. And if I can inject here again, certainly. Um, if you, many of you remember that at the um, area just to the north of the concession stand, uh, we had a big staining problem there, uh, and I believe that we switched over from well <coughs> water for irrigating that portion because I think it turned the back of the dugout orange and it turned the uh, area uh, near the track um, yep. uh, orange as well and so um, that's uh, it's not a good result. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, and moreover, that's a very shallow well. So nothing is gonna guarantee that when we get into an extended drought, it won't start to drop off in its ability to produce water. All right, so, it's, so you've got poor water quality, it's shallow, so there's a bunch, and it's not exactly right in the in the heart of these fields that we're that we're trying to irrigate. So there's there's several reasons why we want to look at alternative groundwater options. So that yields that leads us to the last bullet point in option two, which is develop some new bedrock wells that are closer to the to the site, are are deeper, have better water quality. This is on the left, just a graphic of a of a typical. Uh, groundwater well where you have a submersible pump which is, which is placed you know, down in the bedrock. Uh, so how does a bedrock well function? Well, uh, water flows into a, a bedrock well through fractures in the rock, right? Rock is in itself is fairly impervious, so we're looking for fractures. Um, so we'll, when you're drilling through a well through bedrock, you have to, you have to find what's called a you know, vein, right? Some of us have worked with wells before, we know what a, a water vein is, a fracture in the rock. Uh, to identify uh, locations where you have a higher likelihood of finding fractures, we use some, something called a fracture trace analysis. I'm not a hydrogeologist. We had a hydrogeologist look at the site to conduct a cursory overview of fault lines. That's the looking for fault lines through aerial imagery. Uh, and they did identify some locations that look um, probably, you know, they, they look uh, encouraging. When I charged the uh, hydrogeologist with identifying well locations, we were looking for intersecting fault lines that were not in the limits of the proposed school and the existing school, as well as proposed roadways. So we didn't have a very large you know, land area that we could choose from at the end of the day. So this is the results, and I know this, this probably looks like spaghetti. Uh, it does to me, actually. But what, we're, what we found is on the uh, east side, if you all can see a circular blue, uh, a blue circle there with a three, that's a that's a location that we think uh, could potentially yield some some good bedrock water, as well as uh, option number two. It was brought to my attention that number one is is in an easement, and also it's on the other side of the road, so that would be a lot. We can't use that. So so locations two and three are what we've currently identified as uh, as perspective ground uh, bedrock well drilling locations okay if there's any questions as I go through this feel free to ask all right uh, so here we go so um, well drilling what do you have to consider when you're drilling uh, bedrock wells um, as I mentioned the fractured trace increases the chances of finding water but there's certainly no guarantees you know we're, we're trying to invest a little money to put ourselves in a position to be successful but there's there's no guarantees that we're gonna we're gonna hit a vein because you're taking a six inch hole and putting it down into the ground about a thousand feet trying to find a vein. So there's no guarantees. And also, um, it's our understanding that the, uh, the soil that is on top of the bedrock is enriched with iron and manganese. There's no guarantee that the bedrock doesn't have a certain amount of iron and manganese in it either. All right, we're, we can't guarantee water quality, but we're hoping that through the drilling process, as we find fractures, we can do some water testing as we're drilling deeper and trying to find a strata in the rock that produces water and isn't enriched in iron and manganese. 
So that would be the, the goal here as we're drilling the well is to do some discrete sampling as we're going down trying to find some good water quality and the yield as well. All right. Um, the last point is 150 gallons per minute, which is what we need to meet the peak demand. That's a lot of water out of a bedrock well. It's not unprecedented. All right, we, we, have, we have found bedrock wells that yield up to that, but that's a, that's a lot of water. Even with two wells, we find that 150 gallons per minute is, is probably an unlikely scenario in bedrock. So what do we do? So we need 150 gallons per minute if we want, it, if we want to irrigate these fields that work with play and work with the agronomics. What are the options? What is a typical well, bedrock well at 1,000 feet yield? Oh. In this in this region, I, what would be a rule of thumb? There is no rule of thumb. Again, it's finding a, a fracture and how how open <coughs> is that fracture? How much water pressure is on that fracture? It's it's impossible for me to answer that question. I can but tell you, say you from with a lot of certainty that 150 gallons per minute is very unlikely. So, I what, want what would be like in your expert opinion. What would be likely? R reasonable well yields through. Um, drilling and hydrofracking because we won't just drill the well we're gonna put high pressure water into them to open up whatever open the veins, open the veins up uh, 20 gallons per minute is I would say an average in bedrock um, we just went through a fracture we went through this exact same process in Lincoln Massachusetts in the fall Lincoln historically has terrible uh, yields in their bedrock well we have drilled wells in Lincoln that we've gone down a thousand feet and had nothing but dust. We've not hit a single fracture, okay? But we, we, we went through the same process in Lincoln, and we ended up finding one well that was 25, the next one was 45. So, co you know, combined, that, that's a significant amount of water. We did the same thing in Dedham, we found <coughs> 35 gallons a minute. So, it, by, by going through the fracture trace analysis and the fracture trace process, you know, we're putting ourselves in a position to be successful, but I do not want anyone to walk out of this meeting thinking we're going to find 50 gallons per minute out of a well. Okay, we cannot we cannot go forward thinking that way. We're just we're trying to find the water. We're doing the sure. best we can. Thanks, sir. But 20 is a, a a good nominal value per well. Thank you. Uh, all right. So store. So what do we do if if we don't have enough instantaneous yield? We put in a storage tank. The storage tank receives pumped groundwater. 20 hours a day. So we find a low yielding well. What I have stated is if we have 45 gallons per minute collect it between all the wells that we drill, that will satisfy over 20 hours a night. If I pump, or 20 hours a day rather, if I'm pumping 45 gallons per minute for 20 hours a day, I'm going to be able to produce 54,000 gallons of water, which is essentially our peak demand. All right. But I need to size a storage tank to be able to collect all this water. The storage tank doesn't have to be 55,000 gallons because you're going to be you know, pumping and bringing water in while you're also pumping out. But it, it, needs, it could be significant uh, if that's the case. Um, that I would give you four hours of Before you go further? Yeah. Is, is there any possibility of using the, we don't call it Brennan anymore, we call it the Western Fields mm -hmm. well? If we use the Western Fields well, could we pump that into the tank as well and then have some sort of settling agent that took the iron and manganese out or is that a dilution nightmare? is the only way to solve that problem we we do not there's no cost effective um, way of dealing with dissolved iron and manganese it's it's expensive and it's something that I can guarantee you don't want to be involved with iron treatment for that well it's 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 very um, maintenance heavy and it's expensive okay. um, Good enough said but my <laughs> advice would be that, that based on the concentration of iron in the new wells, we could consider blending it at a certain proportion. And I, uh, we do this oftentimes we get into wells that are contaminated with, the, with road salts. We get into a lot, of, a lot of wells. And I'm hoping that the aquifer that we get into isn't contaminated with de-icing agents. Um, but I can tell you in Massachusetts, it's striking over the last five years how many deep bedrock wells I've tapped into that have high uh, sodium and chloride. So we don't know until we drill the well. Um, but that's something we can consider. Um, we could also consider, because it's close by, um, bringing, supplementing the groundwater with domestic water. So if we get into a really uh, a drought period, we need a little bit more water, 
we can supplement. We're always asking for the groundwater first. That's always our highest priority, but if we deplete the tanks down to a level where we need a little bit more water, we can always recover them a little bit with, with domestic water. So that water is high quality, and it's, it's guaranteed to be there when we need it, assuming that the water purveyor doesn't shut us off in times of drought. If there's a water ban and everybody in the town has to play nicely and shut off the public water, then, then that might be when we would look at bringing in some water from Brennan. Or from good, good news and bad news. The city provides the water. The bad news is we'd have to be number one following the rules if, <laughs> if there was a water ban. Yeah. Right. So when, when we need it the most, it may not be there. So that's why it would be it would be a good idea if we were able to sustain the irrigation um, from our new bedrock well that we that we could. <coughs> but I, I think we need to look a little deeper into um, the water bands in town and what would be the likelihood. In 2016, we're in a historic drought. I'm curious if the water department employed any water bands in 2016. I wasn't mayor at the time, but you should say we did. I think we did. Yeah, I think we did. August yeah, in 2016 yeah. was terribly dry. Yes. Yes, 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 yes we did. It was the first it. time in a lot of years. The yeah. reservoir was we, we had pulled down the Lake Mirror and Mishi to the point where the people up there were really annoyed with us, right? right. And yeah. I think that's where they started the, I think the uh, connection. Isn't that the Pawtucket? Yeah, yeah. 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 last year was the first time we had a lot of years, too. Okay. Which is that's good information. So you know, to, to your point, then we would we probably look at bringing in a certain proportion of the water from the from the western field. And then one other question: We had talked at one point, and I don't know whether we talked in the working group or here, but at one point we were talking about having roof water go into uh, an underground cistern as an environmentally sound way of capturing some water and then using it. But if I remember right. That water has to be treated because um, birds. Correct. That's correct. Yes, you have to disinfect birds the water. Defecate, and That's you have correct. to dis even mm -hmm. though they defecate on the fields when they fly over them. If so, that is now no longer an issue for us. We can no longer do that. We don't have to disinfect the water if it's coming from groundwater. We can use it in its raw in, a, in its raw state. But we would have to disinfect the water and incur an expense if we were to have that cistern. Correct. If you are. Bringing the water in from from stormwater runoff, whether or not it's roofs or parking lots, then we and we're using it for sprinkler irrigation. We need to disinfect the water. But if we're using only groundwater from our new wells and the wells at the western field, then we're not going to have to disinfect it. Right. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that point. And I think you you mentioned that several meetings ago, Jeff made an initial discussion with Jeff and you know, one of our meetings that it seemed to be financially uh, undoable to have. The cisterns <coughs> doing the rainwater because of the cost to do the disinfecting and the maintenance costs of, for maintaining the system. And the fact that they just don't have they a lot of effect on the irrigation on the bottom line of the water balance. They don't when, produce enough. When you need the water, um, it's not coming off the roofs. It's not raining. So it's it's not they're they're competing against each other. So the 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 more um, guaranteed return on the investment is is going with wells and putting in a tank if the wells don't produce enough water to accumulate well water and then using that for the irrigation system. And that's <coughs> and that is very precedented in similar uh, school development projects that I've been involved with through that I've been involved with uh, throughout Massachusetts. What I am proposing here, you're certainly not the first one to do this to take this approach. This is what we end up doing quite frequently. So so just to to sum up because I wanted to w would this be a combination then of hopefully you know, creating two new wells, mm -hmm. being successful, and then potentially supplementing, it says domestic water. Mm -hmm. we're, are we talking about the western fields? Uh, or are we also, or a combination of the western field I, well I, what I What I think we ought to do city water. Is, is we have city water coming in as a backup regardless. Okay. All right. I, I just, I would be uncomfortable when we are investing this much in these athletic fields to not have that that kind of a, a factor of that safety uh, net underneath us. If something happens with a power supply or something happens with a we something could could go wrong. Um, or the other thing too is um, the the calculations that I have presented here tonight as 150 gallons per minute assumes that the grass has roots. 
it is rooted into the soil. If these are sodded fields, when sod first goes down, it requires twice as much water that it's normally going to require once, it's, once it has its roots down. So if these are sodded fields and they're, and they're sodded um, in a time of year where we have a lot of you know, heat <coughs> and what's called the evapotranspiration, we're, we're evaporating the soil from the soil and the, the plants are growing, then we're going to need more than 150 during grow-in. Now, if so we... So can we stop you there and ask Joe or Craig, or what are we planting? Are we planting sod or seed? Sod is currently in the budget. Sod, and typically the, uh, the watering is included within the maintenance contract of the person who installs it. They so, have to, so they the have to, they have to the turn it over to us after a certain amount of growing time. Correct? Yes, yeah, well, after a year and a half or two years after the growing, after the sod is established is when the school takes over the maintenance of it. So um, either the water is trucked in or they reimburse for the water, but it's, they, they're, they're on the watering of the fields for that period of time. So if they're using the irrigation system, whether they're paying for it or not, they, we have to be able to deliver, or somebody has to be able to deliver that much water to this sod when it first goes down. Does the, uh, does the chosen water source have any effect on the warranty of the equipment? I mean, because you're talking, I mean, if we're talking wells and you're probably talking, I know the water here, it, I'll call it hot water. Mm -hmm. So obviously you're going to have your, your, your gaskets on your sprinkler heads and all this other stuff are going to be not a pure water running through them. I'm not concerned with that. I mean, the, the pump system is going to have, um, it's going to have a filter on it. And we're not, it's not going to have any disinfection equipment, but it will have a filter. So it will catch, if there's some, if there's some particulate that's coming through the pump system, the filter is going to catch some of that. Um, but no, it, the, um, <coughs> a hard water source is not going to impact the irrigation system warranty. Okay. okay. Uh, and in terms of the, you know, the sizing of the tank, the materials, I'll get to the sizing um, on the next slide. But as far as materials go, um, we typically would use either fiberglass or concrete. There's, there's you know, pluses and minuses to those, to, to those two different types of materials. Um, my understanding, uh, based on conversations with Sammy Otis, is that the groundwater table here is high. So uh, if these tanks are empty, they're going to have the tendency to want to float. So concrete tanks might be something we'd want to look at as opposed to fiberglass to counteract buoyancy. We'll have to cost them out both ways uh, with, with fiberglass and, and um, with concrete. So this last slide that I'm going to show you is um, tank size requirements uh, as a function of aggregate well yield. All right. And this is, so basically what we're looking at is if we drill two wells or you know, maybe some of that, well, let's just say we drill two wells. Um, their combined flow uh, is equated to a tank size that's needed to accumulate the, the water to achieve the peak 55,000 gallons a day uh, demand. So our, we're, we're kind of going into this thinking 30,000 gallons that collectively between, between the, the new wells and then any supplementing water that we're going to have through um, domestic water backup or some contribution of the western field, um, that's an, a number that I've discussed with uh, Castle Booz in terms of budgeting. But um, we, might, um, we might consider bu budgeting a little bit higher for a 40,000 gallon tank. Again, we, don't, we will not know the final requir size requirement until the wells are constructed. So just kind of reading through those qualifying points at the bottom of the slide, uh, these tanks assume that 100% of the irrigation demand is met with the new well water. Uh, the tank size is also assumed that we're irrigating six hours a night. If we extend our watering window to eight hours, the way the, the flow balances work, we can reduce this, this, the uh, storage requirement of the tank. So if we um, go into this with an eight hour window rather than a six, we can look at shrinking the size of the tanks. All right, And again, they're going to reduce with addition of domestic water or the, the well water uh, from the Western field. So that's um, really all I wanted to review with you folks, just to kind of give you an overview of, of where we're at and, and how we're progressing our design. You know, I'd be happy to answer any, any questions that you all might have. Yes, sir. What, uh, <clears throat> what, what, is being, what has been carried in the budget to cover this whole scenario? Right now, we, we're right now combined between the cost of 
uh, the storage tanks and the, the irrigation system we have. Jeff, we said 502,000. 507, uh, I think. Yeah, Jeff's uh, estimate for what it would cost to do the irrigation system, um, the tanks, and what are the components? The, the, the well, the pumps. The wells would come to about 475, I think you said. Mm -hmm. So we have enough in the budget right now. We're, we're carrying a number okay. that's sufficient to cover the cost of doing the, the process. We just don't know exactly what we're going to do yet. So we're kind of playing it kind of conservative. So we have carry, we carry enough in the budget to cover what we have to do. I wouldn't imagine there's a, a, a huge demand, uh, price difference from a, a 40,000 gallon tank to a 35,000 tank, is there? Uh, no, they, they do go up and they do jump up in 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 size to, in cost depending on what size you're using. Uh, so we originally sized two fifteen thousand gallon cisterns for the rainwater. We were thinking of doing the rainwater uh, collection, um, and we did have with those tanks a an anti um, uh, floating mat, a concrete mat in the bottom with stakes to hold it in the ground. So and straps basically to anchor the tank yeah. in the ground when it the jets out when it's empty. And it wants to pop up to get the groundwater. Um, so we, we've carried it up to do the kinds of things that we need to do to, to make it work. Okay. So to your the, the cost differential is about three dollars and fifty cents a gallon. D so that's that's about the number that we are getting from from our contractors for for storage tanks. So if you're increasing it, you know, ten thousand gallons, then it's not an insignificant additional right, cost. 5, Like again, so we have sod currently with an agreement in place for the growing or for that that's something that one and a half to two year. Um, when it's or sod, it's a little bit shorter because you just have to establish the roots. Okay. When well, it's seeded, um, that would be the two year cycle. Okay. So, so right now we have sod, and the as part of the contract, the the watering is the responsibility of the the company laying down the sod. Right. So that extra amount of gallons per minute is part of the requirement of whether they have to supplement with what we traditionally have designed. Right. For um, yes, that that would be their responsibility, and, and we haven't gotten into great detail about this as far as field turnovers. We talked a little bit about the time frame of sod versus seeded, um, et cetera. But in the end, when we take final acceptance of the fields. It's to make sure, obviously, they've met certain requirements that are industry standards. Um, they'll actually do slices and check the root depth to make sure it's established. They typically like to see six inches or so of good root depth before, so that it doesn't pull up. And, and so a lot of those are factors in it. But we do require a minimum to before that you guys would, we would recommend final acceptance by you guys. One good thing about having a tank is that if we are into a situation where we have an increased demand, we can bring a truck out tanker truck in to refill the tanks. Because we're we're providing the, the irrigation system has a has the pumping system to deliver the water. And if we are running short, they can just bring in a tanker truck just like they're filling up a a gas a tank at a gas station and fill it fill it up with truck and water. Because if, if you don't have a tank, um, then it's very difficult to do that. You know, they're going to have to bring a pump up to their truck to try to get into the irrigation system would be very complicated. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Seth. We, we are good. Awesome. Hopefully we're all set. So, Jeff, uh, yes. next steps. Yes. What are you looking for in the near future? Well, I'm getting uh, specifications. I'm getting specifications <laughs> to you uh, yeah. by Friday. Uh, but I won't have engineered drawings ready to go by Friday, but the specifications will be at least drafted up and ready to go, which includes the well, which includes the tank, which includes the tank and everything that we just discussed. And at, at what point would you be looking to uh, test the wells? Well, I, I would, as, as soon as possible, um, I guess I need to understand um, as soon as possible, but in terms of who's, who's control. How does that work contractually? I will need some assistance from you guys to help me figure out how that gets worked into yeah, the contract. So may I ask, is this something that's bid out for a well driller, or is this something that's hired by Consigli? How, how do we do this? Given the scope of it, I mean, the cost of a well drill is the estimate, best estimate for you. To drill a singular well is yeah. twenty to 25000 So we could, there could be something that could be 
procured through the GMP process, I believe, um, by Consigli to drill those wells. So it's early. not a filed so subbid, but it would no. be it would be one we of the non do it. non filed subbids that they would procure. Yeah, I believe so. We, we'll, we'll verify that, um, but I believe that we are able to do it in this scenario. Um, as Jeff mentioned, that really the goal of being able to drill the wells as soon as possible is we'll have more definitive information to be able to design the system, and and so that means a more definitive cost when we do put out the system to bid, um, rather than just making assumptions and from that standpoint, am I Correct. making mm -hmm. that statement? But that would not be part of bid package two or bid pack yeah bid package two. No. No, we we wouldn't do it as part of bid package two. It would. Be, it would Part of package three in May, um, but it may not be ready by that point either. Only we might have to, as Jeff said, carry the, the standard system as part of what the bid is, and then when we are able to do the well digging, if that happens sooner than later, I'm talking summer, Jeff, or we're talking more like <coughs> a month. Well, it would, it would be difficult to have it happen in a month, but we certainly could do it in the next two to three months. I mean, what what we do when we when we um, put wells out for bid, um, we have a basis of the bid, which is typically six or 700 feet. And there's unit prices on, on everything. Because we don't even know what the depth of the overburden material is that they're going to be casing off. So we make assumptions on the overburden depth, the drilling and bedrock depth, um, you know, all, the, all the components. <coughs> and then they're going to provide unit prices on, on everything. So we might. Um, even though the basis of the bid might be a six or seven hundred foot well, if they only go down five hundred feet, then they're paying us. They're paying for five hundred feet, and if we have them go to a thousand, they're paying the adder to go to a thousand. So we're we're uh, very uh, tapped into this construction process while the drillers are on site, and you know we pay for what they drill. We we put our best foot forward to put together the bid document and the basis of the bid, but it's never going to be exact. Okay. So we'll, we'll get a unit price as part of the bid. And then we'll just use that to calculate the, the change, whether it's a plus or a minus yeah, at the end. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Jeff. All right, you're welcome. So, it's me again. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stand in the back like I traditionally do as well. And what we wanted to do today is we're at the 60% phase, as we'll take a vote later on tonight hopefully in uh, approval. Um, and so as part of that, we wanted to just update you on the design. Um, we brought some new exterior images. Um, nothing significantly has changed on the exterior. We just had some new shots that we thought we'd bring them to the group to see. But one of the main goals of today is to show you the direction we're going on in the interior. Uh, if you remember when we did walkthroughs early in the process, we just said those were representative that we're gonna go through materials, and colors uh, at a later date, and today is that later date. Um, so without that, without further talking about it, I'll just show you some of the imagery that we've created. So that would be uh, just an aerial shot of the exterior. And you can see with the, uh, you can't see with the laser point, but if I go up and below, you can see the uh, drive loop um, with the, the four houses and the main entry, and kind of how the building um, has a presence out along the street front the view down the entry drive and how they, uh, you can see really how the houses and the main entry being prominent really step down the scale of the building um, and really start to sh uh, show what's going on behind them too, not only from the transparency but the identity of each four houses being broken up going down the uh, driveway. We wanted to show that we brought this along because the existing archway that is out there that we're looking to relocate um, to show the location um, or potential location that we're planning on putting the new archway where we'll reconstruct the piers and then bring the arch over and the reason we looked at placing it here is because this walkway you could see is one of the prominent walkways from a public and from a student standpoint where we're standing in the from this image is where the student parking lot is um, so this is where the students would park and they'd walk under the arch to enter into the school. But also when the public, from when there's a football game, a soccer game at night going to the stadium, it functions in the exact same way that it does now as a gateway to that 
for even when visitors coming through, they have to go through the Attleboro Gateway. And so that's why I specifically chose this location because it re really reflected what the purpose of it is currently, and, but and kind of helps bring it even together as far as the promenade of students entering the building every day. And the, as we, we spent a lot of time looking at the plaza, if you remember back from a design standpoint, and so as part of that, we've, we've shown the design here with where you could see the trees, which create that natural um, environmental uh, crime prevention so that it keeps people back from the building with automobiles, et cetera, um, and, but allows a nice natural plaza with shade uh, for students to, to sit out in the plaza, uh, to congregate outside the building. But now we're, so I, we showed those images just to try to kind of bring everybody up to speed from an exterior standpoint about some of the things, but we're really here to talk about the interior and how we've developed the interior to bring us to today. And as from a design standpoint alone, we look to create a modern timeless design um, that has simple clean lines <coughs> that really is an inspirational space for the students and for the teachers. And in doing that, Architecturally, as you've kind of seen and we've talked about on a broad spectrum, it's a lot about how you make the space. It's about the scale of the space, how the spaces interact with adjacent spaces, and, and that gets into, for instance, what we're doing with the breakout areas and the corridors up in the academic houses, that there's, there's a really blending of spaces and we're trying to blend the corridor to the <coughs> classroom and using those kind of details to kind of pull everything together as the building so it's not for instance like the building that we're in now where it's you have a hallway classroom hallway classroom it's really trying to tie the space together to become one <coughs> building and then using the materials and the textures and the colors to really support that idea so when we think about colors and the color theory of a school or in architecture as a whole is we want the colors to inspire and invoke the human emotions and using us, our thought process is using thoughtful design theories that are very, from a psychology standpoint, are proven as far as green inspires creativity and those kinds of items that um, is purely an empirical thought process. While we're thinking empirically, we're trying to make it look good at the same time. We'd be lying to you if we didn't say that, but that's one thing we're, we're looking to do. And even when we think about the colors and how they can, part of the selection is the really looking to use natural materials, natural colors. Um, it's proven to be a calming effect. Um, when we go back to the words you hear about warm uh, and comfortable, uh, but also using color selection that helps reduce eye fatigue, increase attention span, and other things that we're looking for as far as the behavioral response in an educational setting. I'll, I'll use this as an example because I know we'll all laugh too. For instance, red obviously is an angry color, so we try not to put red in the school. Sorry, he's angry, man. <laughs> but we're, that's one thing we, we think about. So, And I brought up some images just um, to support what we're talking about from a color theory standpoint is thinking about colors in nature and how we can bring the, those as they relate to nature and the calming effect of sitting next to a lake like you can see up in the right and how we can bring those ideas into a school as far as the human psychology and natural calming of it um, so that the kids want to come to school. It's not an anxious place. It's an escape from the outside world as part of coming to the, the, that, that natural environment in the school. Now to, to, to build on that, we've developed a, a base palette, which we're showing you up here, um, as far as the base colors that are we're putting throughout the building. Um, you're looking at the carpet um, on the on the upper right is what it's a very natural muted color. Um, you can see the blue lines in it, and when we get into some of the renderings, you'll I'll, I'll be able to explain it more. But when we looked at the school, we knew that the school couldn't be all blue, um, and but we wanted to bring a blue thread throughout the whole school is that element that ties the school together. Um, and so when, when I show you the renderings, you'll see that blue appear in each of the renderings of tying that natural thread together. And we, then we start to use the blue in a higher level 
as part of the core spaces and so those the blue will become stronger as that part of the school and we're talking about the, the cafeteria the media center kind of slicing through the middle of the building and then you can see also the natural colors the neutral field colors so you have a balance of accent colors to a, a neutral palette supporting that you can think of as your canvas as up to the building for places to put student artwork and those kinds of items um, but also the neutral field colors being bright colors is important from a daylighting um, keeping it a bright and airy space <coughs> uh, especially when you get to some of the inner parts of the building so back a while back you we kind of showed this um, to you but it's obviously taken a significant development to get to where we are um, where you have the wood piers here the <coughs> natural element of the wood piers uh, you have that super graphic wall beyond as we've kind of talked about very early in the process and what that wall is beyond is actually a think of it like a wallpaper and we had talked about ways to tie the city of Attleboro together as through our graphics process and I'll show as I zoom in um, a little bit further you'll see on that wall is a list of every street name in the city of Attleboro and then blended into that in bold is all the landmarks in the city of Attleboro so it's a way of graphically kind of poetically bringing the city all together as, as the main central focal point as you enter the school you see the large TV we've talked about as a, a visual display board that can remain active change and, and do announcements but we also know that blue pride is important and it needs to be the thing that you see when you see outside on the pool and that the blue pride is is present you what the first thing you guys want we, that we experience when you enter the current school so if we go in you can see as we get closer to the um, the wall you can see Dave Sawyer still um, in that wall the but we've created those two seating areas on each side as a place to gather it's down near the main entry um, so that during after hours students aren't roaming the building they have a place to gather down near the principal's office to be able to manage supervision of them if necessary um, but the other thing you're seeing in this image is if you look just beyond the seating and the uh, beyond you can see the glass wall there that looks into the stair those are the two main stairs that most people will be using to go up and down in the building so we, we brought those for instance if someone's visiting the building they come out of the, the into the main lobby they clearly see when they walk in there okay these are the stairs so I know how to um, ascend vertically in the building but we also have those key intersections on each side that then directs people and that's part of the natural wayfinding of the design of the building and I'm going to get more into that is how we use colors and materials to support that as well but um, the simplicity and I say that but there's still gonna be directory signs it's a big school we need to tell people where they need, need to go so that um, only like 5% of the people get lost on open house night <laughs> here's a view looking back at the main entry up on the balcony is the assistant principal suite part of what it, we wanted to do is we opened up that balcony to create that very monumental entry you could where we could see the cafeteria ceiling beyond a lot of the natural daylighting coming in from the cafeteria <coughs> and really bring the you know, work, work our main goal was wherever you were in the building wherever you were in the building you could see outside again that's a huge psychological thing of being whether you're in a windowless space or you can see to the exterior is trying to create that space for students to want to be <coughs> in um, keep them active so they don't want to fall asleep as well as part of that but when we did open this up the reason we placed the assistant principal up there is because then they, there's secondary view over the main entry um, so you have multiple eyes looking over that in addition to that what you don't see exactly in this rendering but just to the side of that is where the SOR SRO's office is located and that was strategically placed there too because it puts them near the main entry they're right next to the stairs, <coughs> so they can go up and down and quickly move throughout the building in the event that they need to act on it <coughs> now you've seen renderings of the the cafeteria many times uh, and you've seen kind of iterations along the way and this is where we, we kind of finalized it in a sense um, that the, the the main ceiling still exists as 
that main spine that ties through the whole school looking out over the stadium. Um, on the left you can see the auditorium, on the right is the gymnasium, kind of creating that streetscape front on each side. And we look to take that even when we, you get down and, and start to experience the cafeteria um, with the kitchen servery on the right. Um, you have the innovation lab and the TV studio and the student activity centers that all come off of this space. So it really becomes a hub of the learning, uh, of a learning space, bringing everything as we said, as I mentioned, the hub and the heart. Um, up on the upper level, the balcony, um, we've also created, you can see those little bump outs that become little collection areas through the, in the school um, in that area so that students could gather up there. There could be furniture up there if we choose to or you choose to. Uh, but also then up on the second level is where all the art classrooms are. And as we all know, when you walk through your hallways now, there's a lot of art that's up. Students are doing great work. And we, we want to take that aspect and bring it to the new school and give that opportunity to really put that art on display. And so we, by locating the art classrooms here, they, we created gallery space all along this very public area of the building for an after hours use from the gymnasium to the, to the uh, auditorium to really then let the public see what the students are doing and putting that on display as well as you're doing currently in your school. Jumping down, uh, we move over and you can see the view over to the auditorium from when, when <coughs> within the cafeteria. We looked to kind of create a, a very traditional marquee looking board like you would see on a traditional theater. Um, again, trying to further the idea of creating a streetscape within the uh, cafeteria. Uh, we had talked about putting banners on each side of it that are changeable. They're flexible banners that, uh, and using a medium that can actually be produced in the design communications lab. So those could be regularly changed out by the, and designed by the students, manufactured by the students, and placed up there where they could be changed for a performance that's gonna happen, and really give that ability to customize the, uh, th that space and have it ever evolving for events that could be going on in the auditorium, or, or anything that, that wants to be put up there. Additionally, we have above, you can see the marquee is a large white wall. Um, that was done intentionally. We place color changing LEDs on the, the roof of the marquee so we can light up that wall similar to what we've talked on the exterior so that it, when it's not being, uh, when it's just being the wall, it has a chance to be something more than just a big blank white wall. But the other thought process of it is the potential that it could be coming, uh, become a projection wall if needed to use that space, um, that area of the space. There's no feasible or fiscally way they don't make projection screen big enough for this kind of space <laughs> is the reality of it um, so we look to try to create that in art in the architecture and the design of creating a, that, that that wall is larger than we could get for a projection screen in the space for example but the thought process is you could even use a projector up there um, create uh, and work we could work with the IT people to have a so that you can have an active display going on up on that wall. You could be projecting on it, um, whether it's for a presentation, um, whether you want to have highlights running through it, um, announcement board within the space. So that was really the intent of what we were going for when we put that together. And then turning to the left, uh, you can see the gymnasium, lots of glass to look through it. Really, again, transparency, bringing the spaces together um, from an activity <coughs> standpoint. And as we mentioned, as you can see with these images, the real core and spine of the school, you're seeing the, the blue as a, as a common theme, as that thread tying everything together, whether it's in the seating, whether it's in the signage, um, and just little <coughs> accents of it, whether it's in, in, in the floor. Uh, we're not trying to overpower it, but we're trying to make um, note of it within the school at these areas. The, you can see that beyond is the library up on the second floor, and really that's where we look at this viewpoint of that is Attleboro Blue with white letters that say Blue Pride as kind of that marquee shot. And where we're standing here is where the students would be enter the building from the parking lot. So it really, this would be the first entry the kids would have every day, and that kind of further supports again that really inspiring space when they when they enter the school with a lot of natural light. Um, 
that be with the natural light, we've also put passive measures to reduce the glare with these spaces so that the spaces aren't the, those big glary spaces that you would think of of direct sunlight greenhouse effect on them. The glass is up, up on the upper level is actually has what they call a ceramic frit in it. Um, so it allows you, if you think about like those car decals that you could see when you're in the car, you could see out of it, but it, it shades all the light into it. That's what we're doing with the glass so that it's cutting down, it's a diffusing system so that you don't get the direct, fl direct glare within the space. And then even to the cell side, we've talked about that big sunshade mesh um, that you can see there. That is also a sunshade with that being a self-facing. You can see that it, it, you can see through it, but it, it does cut down that direct glare of the light within the space. So we wanted to highlight a few spaces to, in addition to like the big picture as we're talking through this, some of the major spaces that have you, help you better understand the direction we're going in with this. Um, the auditorium, we talked when we showed you the early renderings of it, of trying to create a really intimate space, um, spaces that the kids are comfortable in, um, as well as having that the theater concept that you've seen with the black box. Uh, so we've with the materials you see up here, it's a very muted um, palette, uh, and we're using really the wood and the blue um, for the of the chairs to really br brighten up that space. And it, but it still creates that very intimate atmosphere, so that the students are comfortable up there as they start to hone their skills as actors, actresses, as an example. So you're seeing the, the direction that the auditorium is going in. You can see we, what we've done is we've created a wrap developing zones using a wood veneer product um, that has a high durability but it really creates that natural warmth in the space but also if I changed here there's th again trying to really create that intimate space you always feel like you're close to the stage not only from your view but it makes um, it feel like you're not presenting to a large group when you're up on the stage so the, these kind of views um, you can't see it that well when I look at it, uh, when I show it up here, but you can see the uh, the ribs on the front of the auditorium balcony there. Those are bringing a texture to the space, but they're very, very functional. What the goal when you design an auditorium is you want to push all the sound out from the stage and not have it come back to the, pr the presenter or the audience. But as part of that, because the balcony sits in the middle of the space, we don't want it to come straight back out. We want to diffuse it all over the space so that it, um, it's more of a diffuse sound instead of a direct sound bouncing back. So if I showed you the imagery, you could see the ribbed panels that you see, the reflective wood panels that would be on that balcony, really diffusing the space. So while we're using natural materials, we're using, these are all stock materials. That's one big thing I haven't mentioned yet. But our goal when we design this building and we apply materials to it further, Everything we're showing you, or I shouldn't say everything, but a majority of everything we're showing you is using stock materials, standard manufactured materials that you could that are in the commercial market to and they give that custom look to them. But that's part of the art of what we've looked to do from a design standpoint. So even the wood ceiling that you see in the cafeteria is a standard wood ceiling that we could put in almost any space. We've just done it on a monumental level using standard materials that are bought off the shelf through a, a ceiling, commercial ceiling uh, manufacturer. So jumping back, you can see the, the, the ceilings are all angled and they'll be tilted, again, to push all of the sound out from the stage. And then when you look at the back of the stage, uh, back of the auditorium, it's actually all, that's all acoustic panel wall surface, again, to absorb all the sound that and so it doesn't bounce back. The seats also function that same way. That's why we're using fabric seats. Is it allows us to really control the space acoustically. Um, so whether someone's, we as people in the space would be acoustic, have acoustical <coughs> properties to us. So if someone's sitting in the seat and it, but um, they're the acoustic, but when they're not, the chairs function. And it really gives us that balance. So whether it's a full house, whether there's a few people, it still performs the same acoustically. And this is a view straight on from the stage. 
what we're plant what we're doing here is you could see the very axial feel of the stage um, for simple circulation, and then as we bring the balcony around, um, and we we brought the the way that the stage is set up because it uh, it opens up to the proscenium opening. When we do this little game with the colors of the chairs, it actually becomes an abstract A, um, and that's where we're it, we're trying to bring that into the design as well. And so jumping into the um, classroom wing um, and the academic core, these have come a very, very long way. And us working with a working group have made a lot of progress. And we, we are very appreciative to the working group with their feedback um, and, and getting us to the point where we're presenting to you today. So we brought along the color wheel. Um, here today to talk and bring some of the support of why we did what we did. Um, when we were talking with the working group, we were trying to figure out what colors and colors that are out of blue colors besides the blue that, that people can relate to. And one of the items that came up is the history of jewelry in the city. So we said, so we took that idea and said, okay, let's look at ideas from different types of jewelry. You have the garnet, the and amethyst, the aquamarine, the emerald, and blue being the sapphire. And so we took that and said, okay, how can we apply this concept to the color wheel with the wood? And so what we've looked to do is pick colors that are on opposite sides of the color wheel so there's a differentiation between them, but ones that all support each other um, from that standpoint. And you, so you're seeing when we think about the houses, each house we're giving an identity not because we're trying to name a house a color, but what it does is it provides a natural wayfinding aspect to it. So if I jump to this diagram, you can really see how we start to place this concept of a natural wayfinding within the building. So in addition to the directory signage, and this is even important because we've reviewed this with the life safety people, the fire department, the police, about making sure because it is a building, they know where they're in the building and they can communicate to each other where they are in the building. So this diagram is would be if we took a, a, a cut through the school and think about it in that sense where you have the four floors of the academic core. The first floor is a lot of the uh, is the CTE spaces, the administration, um, and that, that is going to have its own palette tying the, those spaces together. But when you get up into the houses, each house then starts to identify by a color, <coughs> and that's purely just so that when people know, know where, they're, where they are in the building, when they're in the, in the left wing, the emerald wing, for instance, um, they could say, okay, I, I need to go this way to go to the build to, to this area. Because the reality is, is, as part of what we're doing with the efficiency, creating all the houses to be similar, that, that they, they start to look the same. So we're trying to give each one of them an identity so people can understand where they are in the building. But because it is a four-story building, we're also looking at how we can identify help people understand where they are vertically within the building. And so using the colors to define the houses for, uh, vertically, we actually got very literal because doing a color and a color would be just confusing. Um, so we, we actually placed numbers, super graphic numbers, within the floor, in, within, within each floor so that people can under, further identify them in the Garnet number two, for instance. I know people are gonna come up with names potentially as we design it, but. We're using this just to present the concept of the colors. So how, how are we employing this? Every academic core, when we're looking at it, is has its base palette of, you can see the carpet with the thread in it, really defining the circulation path down the corridors and breaking it down by turning the carpet. So you're, instead of looking at it in a line, it's, it's coming uh, perpendicular to you. The, um, walls would all remain the same. We have the, the tile up to about four feet, again, from a durability, easily cleanability standpoint of, of it uh, being. And then we've talked, so all the carpets and all of these floors in the academic core are carpet, and but they're not a carpet when you think about them with a function. We, we brought the carpet into the working group that we're proposing here, and I think that it was a good show from that standpoint is you we literally could, you could pour water on it, you could pour wine on it, and the way it looks like carpet, it feels like carpet, but the way material it's made out of, it's naturally 
resistant so there's you don't have to shampoo it um, they use it a lot for instance like in hockey rinks and then so you can see that carpet is a very durable carpet but it really brings a lot of the warmth to the space um, and so that's why we're seeing a lot of the carpet for places out here for the kids to sit on the floor and work versus sitting on tile for instance um, but and we started to find the scale within each area where you can see different zones we've created down <coughs> along this individual house you can see the super graphic of the two on each end so people could as they work their way through the building and then the, where we start to identify the color in each house is the portal the entry to the doorways of each classroom so as part of that I'm, we're going to just kind of go through and so you can see how each of these colors are implemented within the neighborhoods so that's that and we're giving you different views along the neighborhood too this is actually up on the fourth floor um, where you can see then there's the stairway that connects the, the third and fourth floor house together as well as you can see the bright daylight coming in from the skylight above really bringing that natural light into the core of the building as well and then looking <coughs> below <coughs> looking up to that stair connecting and we just put an axe on together section cutting through the building where you can see the houses where you can see the the, the stairs beyond and the super graphics and the colors and how that all can cut that ties together as part of the building and then when we think about the media center that as we mentioned this that that we always thought is the heart of the school where we placed it the way we've designed it the access to it and so we saw that as bringing all of the colors of the houses together in a combined palette um, and then using still using the blue thread um, in the acoustic panels to tie the blue through into the building but using a lot of the, of the other materials so you can kind of this is what the uh, the library is turning into what it is a two-story space as we've shown you in a lot of the renderings you have the small areas on the side for collaborative areas within near all the reference books um, spaces for students without throughout and then even from that spine that of, of the ceiling of the cafeteria extends its way all the way through the building all the way into the library so it really creates that connection through there through all the transparency um, and using the two different tones of wood to really create a balance and warmth in the space and this this area is also carpeted and that's an acoustical thing um, we want to use carpets to absorb as much sound um, to make the, the library as quiet as possible and even the what you're seeing up on the wall um, the um, different lines and directional lines those are actually derived from a bamboo forest and create, trying to abstract the, um, again, the natural elements and the organics within the building, but keeping the scheme of, the, the building is really about lines when you think about how we've organized it, how we've designed it, lines connecting together, whether it's planes. And so we're trying to demonstrate that. Again, this is a standard material that you're seeing right there, um, where it's just layering two different color of acoustic panels on top of each other to create a three-dimensional acoustic panel but really brings some vibrance to the space this is something that people can see when they're looking up at the library from the ground at night for instance when when the lights would be on and then of course there's the a uh, on on the on the front glass wall um, transparency you can see through it but it, again it's that welcoming piece where we've looked in the front in the area we're standing here it's scaled down so that you have two stories uh, two floors connecting with an interconnecting stair that um, so that all the reference books would be on the first floor the upstairs turns in much more of a collaborative area so there's a balance of that we've worked with the librarian to make sure there's a, also supervision and the ability so that kids can be either place and as I, as I go so you go up to the upstairs so we walk up the stairs you can see the wood ceiling extending its way through and it becomes more of a collaborative area up here so you could still look out through the building you can look down through to the the uh, cafeteria and again you can see the blue threads in the furniture as well and the, this space these space up here have both outside collaborative spaces but enclosed collaborative spaces so a teacher could bring a class in there and have and work with them and educate and, and uh, collaborate with them without disrupting the whole library and course we've shown you the gym it's come it, um, in a very positive direction 
since we as we've been working with it. Um, I can't remember if we had shown you the gym floor at all yet, but um, <coughs> we we spend a lot of time working with the athletic director, looking at different gym floors with school administration, trying to find a floor that's right for Attleboro that can really give that blue pride um, to the school when people come in. As we've mentioned before, this is an 800, 1,800-seat gymnasium with those bleachers. So it's the only space in the school that you can get the entire school population in it. And it kind of gives me goosebumps when I think about it because I was fortunate enough to be down here one day programming when they're doing a pep rally. And because the gym is the size it is, they can't, they have to break it up by class. And that was just an amazing experience just to see. I mean, not for anything, but it brought me back to the days. But also to see the pride and, and that now if we could imagine bringing all the classes in there at once, it's going to be a really great experience for the kids um, as well as just from a school and a community standpoint. We'll be, we're updating the banners, installing new banners up in the trusses, um, you, new backboards. Um, they're all um, retractable. Um, they also are manually adjustable up and down, so the, uh, if there's uh, whether you want to drop the down for a younger population to work it, to, to use it, we can drop them down a little bit, um, and that's all ability. It's all motorized. Everything can come up and down. Um, we're looking to create as flexible of a space in that sense. We're always, we have those four teaching spaces within it that curtains can drop down. There's a projector projection screen in here. Um, so that then, for instance, if there's a pep rally on, you can project in the space. Um, and when I joked about earlier, the uh, projection screen and how big they make them, this actually is the biggest one they make that we're putting in here. So you can kind of see the, the scale of it. And it's right behind the American flag for when it drops down. Um, there's the mat hoist in there to hoist the cheerleading mats up. To again, free, uh, what we're looking to try to just put as much up in the ceiling as we can, purely because that that doesn't have to use up prime space on the floor. Um, like you have your cheerleading mats pushed in the corner now. We're getting those out of the way. There's also where we're standing, if we look directly up, there's a batting cage that'll drop down out of the ceiling that comes with its own protective mat to put under it so that um, when the base, well, the baseball field won't be flooded now, but um, during for in the spring before the field really become usable, they can work in there. It also has the ability for the phys ed program to use them not only are they batting cages or pitching or whatever you want to do it, but they're designed to be able to use golf balls in them. So they add that to the curriculum as part of the teaching process here, really giving the kids different opportunities right within the, in the, the walls of the school. Uh, we've talked about the um, luxury boxes or fitness center up <laughs> on the upper floor um, that really connect, bring that connection um, from the gym up to that space so that, and the Phys ed instructors specifically have liked this. Not only does it create a really a monumental space of creating those all part of it, the very collegiate feel of a field house, but they like it because they can. It gives them great supervision during the PE hours because whether they could, if they have members, they have kids down on the main floor, they could be up in that window supervising people up on the on the upper level in the fitness rooms, and then supervising also kids down on the floor. One of their main goals, even as we talk to them, is that they could have overlap between the staff, being able to watch each other's kids as well. And that really gives them that opportunity to exist, in addition to creating very monumental views like this. Looking down, this is why we joke to them as luxury boxes, um, even though they're purely functional spaces. One space is a weight space. One is a cross-training multi-use space, um, again, that are all connected together. So when we talk to the phys ed instructors, they really like that because they, be, they're being all a connected space, that they could send some kids into to do weight training, some could be doing spinning or CrossFit in other spaces and they could see them all and really give kids different opportunities for what they wanted to do, that they don't have to just do one thing that the whole group is doing. Yes. A question about that, um, going back to the gymnasium, maybe it wasn't there at that meeting. Why did we make the decision not to put a track up top after just going to Franklin High School like a month ago, you know, because the, the viewing that the, the, the spectators up there, the <laughs> sight lines, what, what was the rationale why we didn't go with the 
cost. It, yeah, at the time it was about cost, and it's not a reimbursable cost. Right. Mm -hmm. With the MSBA, it's an excluded oh, cost, so we would have had to pay 100% of it. And, and we were trying to be mindful in those early stages of trying to get um, to a, a budget looking at, you know, w what is the financial appetite of the city and and where it kind of felt like it would exceed the financial appetite. And and so we, you know, there were a lot of strategies about how to stay within um, that range. Into that. Yeah, it's, it's not a functional <coughs> track in, in terms of running. You know, it's a square track, even, even the high school in Franklin is a square track, so you have to kind of, the walking kind of track. So it's not used necessarily for school visit activities. It's, it was. Yeah, that was never intended to be a functional track. Well, but, this one's, but on this one, so the only seating is in the actual, the only viewing area is either the press boxes or in the seats. Well, there's windows up no, on the yeah, second so floor along the corridor. Oh, I thought that was up on the These are all, so the, on the left of the picture, you can see the daylight coming in from the clear story windows. On the right is actually a corridor um, of the building oh, okay. that has all glass in it. And actually, if you look, um, next to the basketball hoop closest to us, you can see a little white piece in that window. That window is actually designed to be s a sliding window, like a, yeah, a dental window, so that uh, AACS could film games from up there, for instance, and really give that view from center court as part of their filming process. Um, but yeah, th those have the opportunity as that viewing platform for the community as well. Thank you. You're welcome. And so if we if we take a step back behind there, you could see graphics on the wall. Those that was always part of the design, but now we're working through what those graphics really mean and how we can apply them so that in the front you're having Attleboro go blue, but in the back is kind of an ode to the history of Attleboro Athletics. And so when we look at that, we it's a big super graphic collage, and we put this together just to be representative. We're going to be working with the yearbook group, um, with people within the community, to really help identify significant moments in Attleboro's athletics so that we can really put those on display in a ver very subtle mural, super graphic kind of nature that we put, as you can see, like uh, it the, the putting the f football <coughs> helmet person with the um, very angry eyes was an easy thing to do as far as a stock image, but we're looking to kind of build on that and you could start to see here we're when we're in the weight room starting to pull in imagery for instance that could be appropriate for the weights and then here over the in the cardio suite again some more imagery um, a lot of these are just stock imagery that we put together to, to designate it so these aren't the final graphics so to, uh, from that standpoint um, but w they are we did them to start to get the idea across of what we're, our goals were from a graphic standpoint um, some other things that we brought along just to show how we've progressed on the interior. The, this, where we are standing now, is actually the main office. So the door to the right is Mr. Rooney's office. And this is the backdrop wall. And what you're seeing in the foreground is the main admin desk. You can see on the upper right is the existing clock that currently lives in the old Brennan slash high school. Um, we actually have been working with a manufacturer that's local. Um, we asked them to go down and survey the clock, make sure it was salvageable first of all, um, and that it could be refurbished as we our goal was. <coughs> the good news, Jason was nice enough to let him in the building, is that they feel very comfortable that they can use it, they can restore it back to its original integrity, and we wanted to put it in a prominent place as we joked, as I joked about earlier, right at the main office as the clock. Um, and as part of us doing that, we wanted to make a his, just make an ode to that school as this backdrop graphic of people entering and of the old high school, the history of Attleboro, and to the point where, when we, if you remember when we were designing this, the current school, we were using that as a model, mm -hmm. but with a modern twist on it. So that's really bringing everything together, as well as just having a TV on the wall as well to um, really work it again as a, a digital announcement um, for the office area. Across from that, the Career Center. These are two very important areas when we talk about the main office. They're the first experience of the public coming in. 
we talked about the career center and some of our goals for that of, as we designed it as a space that is creates opportunities and inspires the kids for what they would want to do after college but also then whether it's going into a trade or that uh, using the experience that they got at the school from a, uh, one of the shop programs um, whether a kid chooses to be an architect a mayor any of those kinds of things it, giving them the resource and really inspiring to that goal and so we, we want to choose just a very simple graphic that didn't overpower the space so that the actual things that go on in the space that TV's there for for instance when a uh, college would come in to give a presentation to the kids there's a, they have a TV um, there can be again announcements from a career center standpoint there is there anything you want to say before you go uh, Joe and I are leaving to go to the <coughs> concom if the vote to submit to the MSBA requires a roll call vote please record me as yes <laughs> We want to state quick that these images are showing the graphics and highlights. That's why all the yeah. doors and everything are yeah. white. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like these that, aren't the colors, so to speak, is what you're seeing here. It was we even when you go back here, we kind of muted all the colors so that the graphic popped to kind of demonstrate what um, the actual the scope of the graphic in there <coughs> with this. And these truly are just purely wall graphics. And what, why we, I say that is the beauty of a wall graphic is you can take it down and put a new one up. And your, your design graphics area has the ability to do that. And that was even when we're doing, the, we talk about creating a timeless design. We want to keep the building feeling current. And graphics, because you have the program right in house, is a great way to do it in a very economical way. So this graphic if people get tired of it um, after a couple years and or you want to change directions of the career center you're not locked into the uh, this wall surface for instance a vinyl wall covering you can really update it but in the end it is a vinyl wall surface it's um, a vinyl wall covering but it's got a little bit more than just a texture to it um, it has some vibrance to it it's all UV ink so it won't fade um, and so it's the, um, we showed it to the working group, the product that we're using for it. It's a really, it's thick, it's durable, so it actually functions as wall protection for the, those areas as well. The welcome center of the district admin. We took this as an opportunity to really start to create an identity for Attleboro Public Schools. It's the main entry to their um, central administration. This is where people, what the view of people have when they first walk into the building. Uh, uh, this area of the building is this backdrop wall. And using we've used a lot of backdrop walls, as you can tell, because they become subtle. People notice them, and they, they become that, using them in the perpendicular when you approach them, they become that focal point, or they become the canvas to what's going on in front of it. And so what we're doing here is if you look, or if you can tell, is each in that line, the timeline, is e we're looking to create a graphic with each one of Attleboro schools that's ever existed. And so that's tying as a timeline, a graphic timeline across there. And then in the center would be the med a medallion that's actually halo lit to really um, create that identity of Attleboro Public Schools coming together through the history and through the present time. So that's the kind of poetic side of the interiors. Um, before we go into the project update, I want to kind of give a chance for anybody to ask any questions, um, talk about anything, express concerns. I got a question. Time. Yes. And we can use that slide that you get there. You see the, <coughs> the glass on the lower level? Yeah. What is to prevent a vehicle from driving right into that glass to get access to the school? Yeah, I know on right. the back of the school you've got the planters to diffuse that but what do you what do you have over there's here? landscaping along the front there um, there's the granite curb that they'd have to jump um, and but we're trying to do our best in that sense um, rather than making it feel like a fortress even if someone drove into those for instance we've designed the school to have multiple layers especially b as an example the mall is there there's three layers someone would have to get through of security before they could get in the school from the mall area so that's part of our goal even when we talk about it is the ability to segregate and provide <coughs> multiple layers to protect anyone in, in a catastrophic event. And 
I, I could go into greater detail, but we prefer to do that in an executive session yeah. for um, security reasons. Uh, you mentioned the skylights. Yes. Uh, we've had a lot of experience with skylights with this building. Um, how were they constructed and how extensive uh, over the roof area are they? They're, yeah, if I went back to uh, the aerial shot that I showed you earlier, they, there's only four of them and they're all the same. They're a unitized uh, curtain wall, uh, not curtain wall, store, skylight, there's one of them. And the, they're very efficient. They, um, as far as they've come a long ways in, from a, a concern about leaking in that they're uh, a completely sealed system. They sit up on a curb so that that's, well, and then they have multiple layers of waterproofing to keep them from leaking. And they're also, in addition to that, when they're installed, they'll be all water tested to make sure they're watertight when they're installed. But uh, going back, sorry, um, to show you the locations of them. There. I guess I put too many slides in, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so when you're looking at it, if you see each house has a skylight, and you can barely see them because they're really not that big either. But if you follow my mouse right down to the blue, right in the center of each house, in the center of the roof, is where our skylight's located. Now, do they have a projected life like a roof does? How many years you expect them to last? Um, they have a warranty. They they should last. I mean, there's preventative maintenance, as, as Jason knows along the way. Sealing always lasts as long as it can handle from an EV standpoint. As long as you keep up the preventative maintenance on it, as replacing the sealant uh, when necessary, you shouldn't have problems for the, the goal would be for the life of the building, is the reality of it. Mm -hmm. It all would have a warranty on it. I couldn't tell you what it is without looking it up, but. Yes. I, I just want to comment and just say that, you know, um, and this is to the entire design team, Skanska, Consigli, and KBA, that, you know, it's not lost on us about how much of an investment that um, the residents of the city had to make um, for this project to, to come to fruition. And the, the fact that the design team has really worked very hard to try to tie in as much of the city of Attleboro into this one building that we do consider to be the hub. Um, that, you know, from the jewel tones that we've chosen for each of the houses, the fact that um, every street name in the city of Attleboro is gonna be on that graphic wall, the, the beautiful clock that <coughs> I'm actually looking forward to teaching kids how to tell time with hands, <laughs> uh, you know, rather than just looking at their phones. Um, it's, it, to me, it's just something um, that you know, I'm as a resident of the city. I'm I'm very proud of how the design team has made that commitment to um, honoring the commitment of the you know entire city for this project. Craig, yes. So today we're supposed to vote, or our intention is to vote to approve 60% construction document submittal to the MSBA. Mm -hmm. Was that slideshow that we just sat through, was that the 60% proposal? Is that a portion of it? So the, the actual 60% submission of the MSBA is very boring if I told you and tried to present all of it too. It's well, I mean, it's it's going to be the documents, it's the drawings, it's the building elevations, it's the interior elevations, yes, yes. it's the specific drafts, the draft <coughs> spec, right. spec book. It's all 500 so pages of, draw, of drawings. Of drawings. So yeah. Okay. She that is. was my intent. That was what I was intending to see tonight, because tonight I haven't seen anything that uh, would allow me to vote yet on that we have a sixty percent drawing done. Well, Am I, I incorrect in thinking that way? That yeah, I, I I would like to say something about it. I just um, I, I just my maybe my intentions were what I was my expectations were different. I suppose. Yeah. No. What what we're doing here is is a typical standard process mm -hmm. I mean we, we could show you drawings and, and you would just have pages and pages and pages of drawings and specifications and I think I would also include consigli in this that um, Anjanette and Bob have spent a huge amount of time page turning going through the drawings I know, I commenting 
commenting <laughs> on them. Um, <clears throat> part of our comments in our review is when you speak with um, Consigli and we had an in another independent cost estimator, you know, they're commenting, are these 60% construction documents? And we would say absolutely yes. yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good, strong set of drawings. And it take, it's an iterative process. Mm -hmm. It takes time. If we were to bring the drawings in here, it really wouldn't give you the visual representation that you see up here where they're showing you models, okay, which the drawings come out of the models. And so with, without having to do a page turn and you see, you know, some things that are diagrammatic, you're actually seeing what the finished product looks uh, like. Listen, I love 3D re rendering, modeling. It's, 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 it helps with, with bringing it to life no doubt and and believe me i appreciate everything craig i'm a huge fan so please don't think i'm not i just was guess confused sure. on my expectations and what yeah. we were sure and, and one more uh, thing i would say is that that the mass school building authority mm -hmm. um will have a, a, a design firm do a peer review and believe me if it isn't what it should be we will hear about it. It will I'm be documented. Uh, will be dragged downtown for a uh, meeting. And I'm sure. And so I'm not done. Is, so is, yeah. is there is there a summary you can present to us? A checklist <coughs> saying so that I have we have these things in place. Yep. Um, to kind of brief you on that. So what what's included in the submission of the <coughs> SBA? Um, there's an update on the project budget. It includes the two independent cost estimates. Mm -hmm. Um, it recoup includes an update to the total broad the form 3011, which is the form that MSBA uses as part of the project funding agreement. So we keep them updated. That also incru includes tracking through the different phases from a cost standpoint to make sure that we're all being honest and that it's there's nothing that's getting bloated in the project. For instance, down to even the trade. Um, it then we're submitting to them our drawings. I mentioned. We actually would be submitting this presentation in a sense of showing the rendering, showing the materials, because that's really part of what they're looking for as part of this is how, how's the building going to look, what kind of materials are you using. Um, they have the spec, they have all that. Um, and, it, and then um, an update on the project scale. So the 60% is really, as you probably know, a lot of moving pieces in place. Sure. To that point, if you're concerned about if you want to see the drawings, we'll absolutely make them available in PDF to you. Um, if, if that's something that you would like so that you can see them uh, uh, even a, a link would be great I yeah. just I would I'm my interest is to, to see the finished schedules and the door schedules being developed and mm -hmm. to see the riser diagrams being developed from the MEP standpoint and yeah. um, believe me it was a beautiful presentation um, and we've seen and it's great to see how it's developed and yes I understand that modeling comes right from the drawings that's the software and how it's designed and intended to and, and like I said Craig huge fans I mean I love it thank you and your present your commitment and compassion to this project is beyond reproach so thank you for that but again my expectations are yeah. I was expecting to sit here bored to death looking <laughs> at looking at you know finished schedules and uh, reflected ceiling plans and and helping validate that we're 60 percent yeah um, yeah, I mean, if you're comfortable with that, and and if the working group has seen that and is comfortable with that, then I'll go off of that. Um, I just feel that uh, uh, as a committee sitting here, that while asking about skylights and colors and stuff, and and uh, uh, indoor tracks and stuff, or things that we should be asking about as well, <laughs> I just wanted to I wanted to see where the I, I just I wanted to see the the, the drawings. Yeah, and and. and you will because what once we package the submission the submission is is a document it's a report on everything that's been done since the last submission and and so um, you can review the drawings and you, you'll see our comments that there was a constructability review that there's MEP coordination going on that third, um, third, third party structural review and stuff like that third party that structural peer review peer review that yep. the commissioning agent has done a review sure. of the building envelope yeah, and the mechanical system exactly. so to that point yeah if you, the, the way the process is set up so that the committees don't get bored is the honest thing um and most people uh, are in most committees a lot of those committees are are people that aren't in the industry 
so they don't really understand what a 60% drawing level is. So that's why the MSBA has built in these multiple layers of checks and balances okay. where the OPM reviews all of our documents, the CM reviews all of our documents, the commissioning agent reviews all of our documents, and we get spreadsheets on spreadsheets on spreadsheets of review comments that then we're required to respond to and then submit those to the MSBA as part of the process too to, to make sure that that's actually happening, that um, we aren't going rogue for <laughs> as a joke. Yeah, yes. not, not even rogue, just it's yeah. a good check. That, that the due diligence that. is there. And, and, and the other thing, too, is you know, when in the review, we're looking at the biddability of, of the drawings. Like, mm -hmm. you know, could, could a subcontractor bid on this and it would be sure. pretty clear what Listen, their scope uh, From Coming from the industry, from the private sector, I've built buildings on scope letters, you know, or 30% documents. It's the last thing we want to do with the building of this scale, magnitude, and that cost. Of course, I understand that. That yeah. is not how the the state the state has it MSB, set up. That right. It's very prescriptive, and I, and I appreciate you get that. Yeah, rigorous. Full of the is. Well, on the contractor side, I was always very excited to build off thirty <laughs> percent. Change orders. Yeah. Uh, just scope change. We didn't just change order is such a dirty word. No. Scope, scope change. change. Scope change. <laughs> For what it's worth, our our estimate is. 63 pages of detailed information. Okay. And, and Craig, this is this is by no means me volunteering to help you do the submittal review at any point. Oh, God, no, please not. Happy. So we, nothing more boring than that. 63 pages of detailed information unless the drawings are at a level that allows us to do this. No, it's understandable. So, you know, and I just, again, I just, I said my expectations were different than, and, uh, not that it was bad, it's just not what no, it was. I understand. Thought I was walking into. And that's why they're required to have a professional on this project manager involved. I mean, we have to certify that we have reviewed the documents. And and they will also have a peer review afterwards and, and so report on that. Well, what, we, what, we, what I'll do is tomorrow when I get back <coughs> to the office, I'll send a link um, send to, to Gail. Send it to me. Gail, yeah. and she can transmit it out. So that you can download. So we've pr created two documents part of this process. We've got the estimating documents which went to them a month and a half ago yep. that they're doing all their constructability reviews on and as they're doing their reviews they're actually giving us comments live through a, a software called Revisto <coughs> so that we're seeing we can respond to them and so we're actively updating the drawings as part of that so that then they are update, they're updated because on Friday this week is when we're actually going to make the prints, the PDFs of the current 60% set that goes to the state. Okay. Um, so that being said, is I can give you this, the documents as where they were a month and a half ago and send that up um, now. But then when we do submit to the state, um, if it's approved tonight, that we uh, will make a, again, a link that has everything on it that was submitted to the state. That'd be, that'd be terrific. I'd, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and again, I'm hard. not I'm not saying that, it, it, again, my expectations were just different. It's always bad to come in with uh, expectations, right? Maybe we should I'll, I'll put a couple electrical drawings in the next presentation. <laughs> no, it was, it was, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any questions in regards to the what, the, what we've talked about so far? If not, we'll get into the, uh, the, the tense moment of the project budget update. Um, and we can let people know, as they mentioned, we've got two cost limits. They've reconciled everything, um, and they're all within a percentage. Um, so, by with by saying that, and what we know that we can say that the project is on budget, it's on schedule. Um, that we won't like the last time. Remember, we it, we were over budget a little bit, so we had to make do some value management and make some changes to the documents to bring us back on budget. We don't have to do that this time. So. There's not really a lot to talk about unless people do want to ask any questions other than that we are on budget um, and we're moving forward as, as we've discussed, including everything we reviewed today and in past meetings um, that would be included in the project. I think we covered that pretty well last week, right, Mayor? So is everybody satisfied? No. So we, if we go ahead and... Um, Let's have a vote to approve the 60% construction design. Um, so moved. Second. Any objections? No. Any uh, further discussion then before we 
adjourned. Um, well, that's a, that measure is adopted. But any further discussion before we adjourn? Because that was the last that item of business call? tonight. Does anybody want to address anything new? Um, Does it have to be roll call? Oh. It, it's not stated, but if you would like to, I think it's always important to make sure that every buddy agrees with what we're doing here and to document that. Okay, sure. Uh, just a question for you, Mayor. Um, Highland Country Club, how was that irrigated? Was that city water or was that well water? It's um, the water across the street. Um, yeah, mechan it's the Mechanics Pond's name of it. There's a pump house on the Country Club, I'm sorry, on the um, the uh, Condo Association property and this, the city owns that pump house and that water is coming from Mechanics Pond uh, under Mechanic Street and then into the property but we and that's just to irrigate the the grass area the clubhouse and the uh, pro shop and the garage in the back behind the clubhouse that all is city water okay. so that that's something we're looking at turning back over to the condo association in one form or another because the city we don't need that anymore the uh, irrigation system we don't want to necessarily turn it completely over to the condo association but having some type of license agreement where they pay the electric and then they can use the uh, pump house to irrigate their own lawns because last summer uh, we didn't know uh, because nobody had told us when to transfer of it but um, the uh, condo association lawns all went brown you know because the club uh, the uh, pump house was shut down so they, we didn't actually own it until September anyway so hoping to avoid that this uh, this upcoming summer so thank you yeah. so but we want to also keep the <coughs> ability of using that if we ever need it again in the future for whatever reason who knows you what want to lose the easement or the use of yeah. it you don't know what you're going to use that for. yeah that. you know one of the thoughts is that we might have uh, right outside the back of the clubhouse sorry, the back of the clubhouse where the patio is um, one of the things Derek's talked Derek Corsi superintendent of park and forestry has talked about was the uh, like a field of flowers or a tulip field so if that's the case then maybe we'll need that irrigation system but in the sale of the country club all of the sprinkler heads were taken off of all the pipes that were underground so those all were sold so even if we wanted to use it right now we couldn't we'd have to put new sprinkler heads all over mm -hmm. so. okay very good yep. um, so let's go ahead and have a roll call then. Gail, do you want to read off the names? Okay. A minute. Is it? I'm sorry? Uh, just the names. So we have an order. Yeah. Right, right. Off the attendance. Mayor? That's a yes. That's 60%. Ed Perica? Yes. Scott Dominici? Yes. Terry DeSisto? Yes. Bill Rooney? Yes. Let's see what we have. Mark Furtado? Uh, yes, and Shannon Withers as well. Okay. Jason Brento? Yes. Lori Regan? Jackie Romanicki? Yes. Ed Stanton? Yes. Mike Tyler? Yes. And Jerry? Yes. Very good. Thank you. So it's unanimous. Jack was That's a yes. <laughs> and Jack was yes, and we have Jack right. recorded Jack. as a yes. Right. Um, so uh, before we adjourn for the evening, does anybody want to bring any new business forward or any points of discussion you want to address? No? And I have the next meeting. On the next date. On next the 10th? Yep. Um, April 10th? Yep. Should we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Marianne. Okay. 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 I know you're in.